My dear brothers and sisters, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I mentioned in my welcome that we're spending the first couple of weeks here in the program here focusing on the sacraments. Today, immediately following the homily, we're going to be doing a baptismal re remembrance or reminder. Uh, I misspoke a little bit in the announcements. Um, you do need water, but if you could put the water in a pitcher, there'll be a chance for you then to pour it into an empty bowl. If you already have water in a bowl, that's just fine. You can use that as well. No need to get up and get a pitcher. Um, next week, again, we'll be focusing on the sacrament of communion. Now, if you were paying attention to the gospel reading for today, you may have thought, well, I don't know what that had to do with uh, baptismal identity. And it's true that it does not fundamentally or initially seem to be about that. It's really about forgiveness. However, I do actually think it has an important message for us about our baptismal identity. Um, and to get to it, I want to focus on something that comes up repeatedly throughout this reading, and that is, strange as it may sound, numbers, different numbers come up uh, in this reading. And this is, by the way, from Matthew chapter 18, if you want to follow along. Today's reading starts with verse 21, but I actually want to back up all the way to the start of this chapter. Uh, up to that point, uh, up to chapter 18, Jesus has been doing what Jesus did. He's been teaching, he's been healing. Uh, he was recently transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, and so his disciples have the kingdom of heaven sort of firmly in their mind. And at the very beginning of the first verse of chapter 18, they ask Jesus a question. And their question is, who is the greatest, Jesus? in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, remember I, I mentioned that I'm going to be talking about some different numbers. Who, Jesus, is number one, right? Who is on top? What's the pecking order? What does the hierarchy in this new kingdom of heaven look like? Where do I fit in? Am I number one or not? It will not surprise you that Jesus probably was not particularly proud of his disciples uh, with that question. And so he goes on then to teach them a few things about sin. He tells the parable of the lost sheep. He talks about how to deal with people who uh, sin against you. And that prompts Peter to ask Jesus another question. And my read of this is that Peter, knowing that Jesus is a little bit disappointed with all the disciples, is trying to get back into uh, Jesus' good graces. And what you need to know is a little bit of context before I, I cite this question, is that in rabbinic tradition, and the question's gonna be about forgiveness, in rabbinic tradition, the tradition was that you would forgive someone three times for something, and if they did it again on the fourth time, then they would be punished. So Jesus, or, or excuse me, Peter wants to show off a little bit to Jesus, and he decides, well, how about I take the traditional number of forgiving someone th three times and double it, and then just for good measure, add one. And so he says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? As many as seven times? And Peter is trying to sort of show Jesus how generous he is. And, and Jesus, very famously, you may remember this line, says, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times, or in some translations, it's 70 times seven times. The point is, uh, Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, it's not about counting. It's not about keeping score. Forgive someone over and over, again and again, okay? Now, this brings us to a parable that Jesus uh, shares immediately following this response to Peter's question as a way to sort of reinforce this point. It's a famous parable about a, a servant who owes a king or his lord a vast amount of money. And in our translation, we read it as 10,000 talents. Now, most of us are not familiar with first century Palestinian currency. And so we think, well, I don't know what a talent is, but 10,000 seems like a whole lot. So it was clearly a big number, which does not quite get to just how vast or expansive a number Jesus is talking about here. So again, it's 10,000 talents. So let's take the first number. That's, again, a number in this number theme. That comes from a Greek word that gives us the word myriad. And it actually was not originally connected to a number at all. It simply, it simply meant uh, countless or innumerable or a whole lot. 
But eventually it came to be understood as 10,000, just because 10,000 seemed like a really big number. And then you've got that talent, uh, which is a form of currency, or it's actually a form of weight, which represented about 15 years of an average worker's salary. So you do the math and you get 10,000 times 15 years and you are left with 150,000, 150,000 years wages that this servant owed the king. It's a ridiculous amount. And so when we just read it as 10,000 talents and we think, oh, well, it's a particular specific amount of money, it sort of misses the point that what Jesus is really saying to his listeners is something like he owed him a bazillion dollars or a gazillion dollars. It's a ridiculous, extravagant, comically large amount, okay? So the servant uh, begs forgiveness from this ridiculous amount of debt that he owes the king, and lo and behold, the king forgives it. He says, you're free and clear. He tears up the receipt. He sends him on his way without the burden any longer of that debt. And we would think that this servant goes away filled with so much gratitude that he is willing to forgive anyone else any wrong that they have done him. And here's where the twist comes. The twist is this first servant who was forgiven the bazillion dollars of debt sees another servant who owes him, and again, here's another number, a hundred denarii. And that is, it's, it's, it's a number we can get our head around a little bit better or more easily because it's a hundred days wages. So that means it's a lot less than a bazillion, but it's significant, right? It's three months wages. And um, this second servant says to the first servant, please, I beg you, will you forgive this debt? And the surprise in the parable is that the first servant who's been forgiven so much refuses to forgive the second servant and instead sends him to prison. The king hears about it and he throws the first servant into prison. Now, as with all biblical passages, with all parables, we could talk about this parable in a number of ways, but obviously the most significant way to read it is that like that first servant, we have been forgiven a debt that we simply cannot repay. And it's been forgiven for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, we should also, out of a sense of gratitude and freedom from for being forgiven from that debt, be willing to go out in our life and share that same kind of forgiveness to others. It strikes me, though, that part of the dynamic of what's going on with forgiveness is related to that first question the disciples asked Jesus. Who among us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Where do I stand in the hierarchy of things? Where am I in relation to other people? And this question comes back, it seems to me, because when so, someone owes us something, maybe it's money, maybe they have sinned against us and they need our forgiveness, we think we have some kind of power over them which makes us feel important, which allows us to think, well, maybe I'm not number one in the world, but over this person, at least, I am number one. I'm better than them. They're in debt to me, and I'm going to hold it over them so I can feel more significant and more powerful. I can feel better about myself. And when we do that, Jesus is saying, it becomes a kind of prison, not because a king has sent us into that prison, but because we've sent ourselves there and we hold the key. And this, it seems to me, is where this idea of baptismal identity comes into the picture. Understanding our baptismal identity, who we are, can help us get out of that kind of prison. Why? Uh, because if in some way the question each of us is always asking is a variant of the question, who is number one? And again, we may not ask it exactly that way. We may not be saying, who is number one, or am I number one? But we are, I think, and I, if you were here, I'd ask for an amen about this. All of us, it seems to me, are thinking questions or asking questions like this. Am I important? Does my life matter? 
Does what I do have any significance in the world? And maybe at the heart of it all is the question, am I lovable? Does anyone love me? And in answer to all of those questions, our baptismal identity responds with a resounding yes. God is saying to you, again, that you are God's beloved child. God is saying to you, I have adopted you. I have named you. I have claimed you. In the waters of baptism, I have washed your sins away, and I have called you beloved son, beloved daughter. I have said to you, and I say to you again this morning, I love you. As we start another program year here at St. Philip the Deacon, I hear or I pray that we can each once again hear the truth of this baptismal identity so that we can be freed from the question, who is the greatest? And instead, rest in a different kind of knowledge that when it comes to God's love, you are each and every one of you, one in a bazillion. Amen.